that most kind sorry, uh, for the most kind words of introduction. And I also would like to begin with thanking uh, the organizing committee, both uh, Artemis Yoryu and Yanir Milevsky for putting together this ARVA talk series. Uh, the anchor of my uh, talk uh, will be the site I've been working on for two decades now, namely Tarsus Gözükule. Since this series focuses on the Levant, I will try to be relevant to the general theme of the talk and focus rather on the East Mediterranean connections of the site and how they evolved from the second to the first millennium BCE. But please note that this talk does not contain new information. It is a combination of my and other colleagues existing works to weave the story of the region as it was transformed economically, demographically, and politically during this period. The backbone of the chronology of the site is established by the earlier American excavations headed by Hetty Goldman and conducted in the 1930s and 1940s. This was then revised by the Boazici excavation team in a series of cooperative workshops, which addressed the chronologies of various settlements in Cilicia. Here, I show you the second and first millennium BCE sequence. Note that late bronze 2b in Anatolian terminology corresponds to iron one in Levantine Syrian terminology, just to avoid confusions here. The northeast corner of the Mediterranean is connected by sea and between Cilicia, Cyprus, and the Levant, an increasingly dense maritime network developed over time during the Bronze Age. This resulted in formation of close ties that start in early Bronze Age, reaches an episode of a peak in Middle Bronze Age, reflected in the so-called Syro-Cilician painted pottery, Later, during the Late Bronze Age, the entanglements of the major ports of this region with each other and their role as gateway communities to massive amounts of goods shipped are cl clearly manifested in the texts recovered from the multilingual archives of Ugarit. Tarsus is inland, but might have had access to the Mediterranean via Bardan, Kidnos River, as it was closer to the sea than today with the heavy silts carried by the Berdan, Kidnos, and Jehan Piramos rivers, trapping the city further inland over time. It might have also used Kazanne as its harbor town. The mound of Kazanne, although still unexcavated, shows a great number of Aegean ceramics on its surface, indicating large concentrations of this pottery would be present here. Further connections of the region are through the Slician gates, you can see here, uh, where Tarsus is located right at the entrance to it, Kozan uh, Feke, and Kadirli Anderen that connects the region uh, to the uh, central Anatolian plateau, and Bahce and Belan passes that uh, give access through the Amanos to the Syro-Anatolian region. This is the modern city of Tarsus with Gözükule marked here with blue, this little green dot here. So this modern city of Tarsus sprawling both towards the mountains to the north and towards the sea to the south, the Berdan Kidnos River meanders to its east to its east in its current bed. It was going through the city before Justinian changed its course to protect the city from floods. There are archaeological remnants of its integration into the cityscape from the rare glimpses one gets of the magnificent Roman city lying beneath the modern one. And as it is clear from this map, Outside of the city is endless fields cultivated with various agricultural products, a reflection of the fertile hinterland the city commands. Even to this day, the plain and its agricultural products provide for many of the major cities in Turkey. It is within this geography, the first agricultural villages were founded during the Neolithic 
as known from the very lowest levels of Gözlükle. From then on, life continued to prosper uninterrupted in the same locale for millennia to come. Today, we will be talking about the Late Bronze Age and Iron Age periods of this at this site, spanning the second half of the second millennium into the first half of the first millennium. This is a story of drastic changes, but also of survival of the longest standing traditions. And we now start to understand that there is not a single overarching narrative of the story, rather each region, even each settlement experienced a variation on the theme, creating a myriad of stories now lost to us and which we can only glimpse through the veil of broken and discarded material past. What we see sometimes among this debris are great works of art ornamented with most precious of materials and with widely created imagery embellishing them, along with more mundane stuff like pottery. It's the latter that I will be focusing upon, being a pottery specialist, but I hope without forgetting that pottery leaves us with overrepresentation of certain aspects of a culture by its very nature of indestructibility and unrecyclability. We find them in thousands upon thousands and then construct our narratives based on them simply because of lack of other material remains that are not that successful at resisting the effects of time. Here I begin during a period when the settlement was firmly part of the political control of the Hittite kingdom. Its instrumentality to fulfill the Hittites' further ambitions of extending their control over Syro Anatolia resulted in the annexation of this region early on. And they left their material mark on the site, including the official building the Goldman team has excavated in section A, seen here in the blue box. The building yielded material remains that find close parallels in other Hittite centers in central Anatolia. This includes pottery. Pottery of this period is very much of central Anatolian tradition. Plain, heavy, sturdy, with not much surface treatment. I will only show two selected types here. Shallow bowls, here shallow bowls and their miniature versions, as you can see here used as votives, a typical Hittite cult object found frequently at Tarsus Gözükule. And here are pitchers and jars and corresponding votives. These are very mundane everyday use vessels. I'm not going to go into the more details of this corpus as it is very well known, not only from here, but also from all other settlements in Cilicia and the Amuk. There are exceptions, however, to the dull and mundane style of the period. One is the so-called red lustrous wheel made there. Here are two spindle worlds, a spindle, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here are two spindle bottle examples from the new Bozici University excavations. The one on the left is imported with its very fine pinkish clay and high quality surface treatment indicative of canonical red lustrous wheel made ware type. On the, right, um, on the right is a, a probably local one with much coarser fabric and dull red slip applied unevenly. Red Luster's meal, wheel made there is shown to be a production of Göksuvali by Ekin Kozal, who by the large amount of shirts and the wide variety of shapes present here, concluded that Kilisetepe or its environs could be the production center of this highly standardized pottery. Her proposal was later verified by petrographic and chemical analyses performed on selected shards of this ware from different sites, including Kilisetepe, Pelachana, and Boasköy, in a 2019 article by Kibarolu and Kozal and other colleagues. Considering the distribution patterns of red lustrous wheel made ware, Göksu Valley being the source of this ware makes more sense. 
It's found in large numbers in major Hittite centers in central Anatolia, as well as in Cyprus. Further afield, it's encountered in Egypt and the Levant. As proposed by Kozal and her colleagues, Göksu Valley would be a perfect conduit for this distribution pattern, having access both to the Mediterranean, perhaps via the port of Ura, and also to inland Anatolia through the river valley. This also explains why there is very little of this wear at Tarsus Gözükule. Tarsus being at the entrance to the Slishing Gates, one would expect to encounter more of this wear en route to central Anatolia, one of its main consumers, if its origin was for Cyprus, for example. The famous shipwreck site uh, at Uluburun, which had a, uh, as part of her cargo large amounts of Cypriot pottery, has demonstrated that pottery was one of the items of exchange during the late Bronze IIa period. Susan Sherat, in her 1999 article, proposes that pottery started piggybacking on the exchange of more prestigious elite materials like metals, ivory, glass, semi-precious stones, and agricultural value-added products like textiles, oils, wine, as part of a more informal exchange network operating under the pretenses of gift exchange between main political centers of late Bronze Age. Because controlling pottery production was not a priority concern of the palatial centers, sub-elites of the period could use it as part of their display strategy to differentiate themselves from the others who have no access to exotic materials at all. This allowed informal exchange patterns to develop which also started to increasingly add scrap metal into this informal bag, allowing a personal profit to be made by the mediators of these maritime routes, possibly Mycenaean Greeks, Cretans, South Anatolians, Luvians, Cypriots, and Levantine people. Along with Mycenaean, Cypriot, and Levantine pottery, Red Luster's wheel made ware would be another such class of pottery supplied by producers of rough slicia to be consumed in various centers in East Mediterranean who are becoming more and more cosmopolitan through the ever increasing contacts fueled by elite demand. Sherat further proposes that these informal networks eventually contributed to the collapse of this oppressive and overburdened economic system triggering a cascade of events that led to the collapse of some of the centralized states and pushed others into very unstable political conditions. Hittite Kingdom one, was one such ma major casualty, and its collapse had a profound effect on one of its earlier, earliest vassal states of Kizuvatna. Once a region fully integrated into the Hittite political and economic system, Cilicia spins out of the gravitational orbit of Hattusha, the material results of which are clearly seen in the destruction of the official Hittite building known from section A and other official buildings known from section B of Goldman excavations. And in section A, in the place of monumental official Hittite building, buildings of residential character are erected in its stead. Boazici University excavations, working on the site since 2001 under the directorship of Professor Asla Özyar, positioned their new trenches next to this area to investigate it further. Here you can see it. In our excavations, we also encountered architecture that might belong to the same level. Unfortunately, here, this level is badly disturbed by the later Abbasid level occupation and the Roman terracing uh, of the mound to the north. In our southernmost trench, where we have been recovering most of our late Bronze Age material, we have encountered a hearth of an irregular oval in shape, which was made of pebbles. 
There is no architecture found associated with it, but the soil around it was reddish. It seems to be an outside heart, though these layers are so badly disturbed that it is difficult to say much, uh, to say much more with certainty about the exact context. We did not think much about it until I came across R.N. Mayer and Louise Hitchcock's 2011 article on the hearts of Tele Safi, where several curvilinear outside use hearts are connect encountered, which were made primarily of pebbles. They date to late iron one to early iron two A there, which is contemporary with our heart here. One cannot make much of a single heart that has somewhat similar characteristics, but I wanted to mention it, thinking that perhaps it would be of interest to the audience here. In the same trench, we have found several pits that can be dated to late bronze 2B level. These contained central Anatolian style plain wares known from the previous late bronze 2A period. The pottery shown here are from those pits that I'm gonna show. Plates and shallow bowls are a whole monk shape and they have close parallels to the Hittite centers on the plateau. They are made of a medium coarse fabric with lime, sand, few mica and sometimes small amounts of chaff and or shell. It is used in production of utilitarian daily use vessels like plates and shallow bowls that you see here, but also regular bowls, jars, as well as miniature vessels. The surfaces have a limited treatment with just the light smoothing. Scrape marks accrued during the scraping of the bottom when the vessel is leather hard are clear on many examples. Most bowls are also made of the same fabric as plates, but there is a better purified finer fabric used on some of the smaller bowls. They also have a better surface treatment. Fine wear is produced in small but consistent amounts at Tarsus Gözükule. There are also the rare examples of vessels coated with red slip and mostly lightly burnished. Here you see one example where the outside is only partially treated with a slip, which is typical. Jars are also made from these two types of fabric. Typical, sh typical shapes consist of craters, but also jars with very restricted necks. These are familiar profiles from the Central Anatolian Plateau. Fineware jars are mostly smaller but some have quite large diameters as well as you can see here on the top. They also have a better surface treatment, including in some cases, low burnishing. A very local tradition is the cooking potware. Frequent mottling on the surface indicates such use. They were manufactured differently. Abundant amounts of crushed shell was added to the clay as temper. This would have made these vessels more resistant to breakage from temperature fluctuations when exposed to multiple heating and cooling episodes during the cooking process. This is a long-standing tradition in the region of Northeast Mediterranean, known not only from Slicia, but also from the Amok. The cooking pots are made by a locally developed recipe in use since late bronze one period. Also, the shapes are local, some with rims that were made to accommodate lids like these here. There is also a mineral tempered coarse ware that coexists with the shell tempered ware. This repeats some of the shapes we see in jars, especially the strongly thickened out rim that you can see here. Miniature vessels for votive offerings are another hallmark type, hallmark type from the previous late bronze A, 2A period. They are crudely made, but some are still thrown on the wheel. They are miniature versions of typical bowl shapes for regular daily use. 
Same clay is used for these miniature vessels. These were typical for the earlier late bronze 2A period, both here and also in central Anatolia. The fact that they continue to be produced and used after the destruction of the settlement indicates that certain cultic traditions continued to be practiced by the inhabitants. In a trench just north, um, just to the north uh, of the one that I've been talking about, a complete pithos was found in situ. It has a flat, thick base, elongated, ovoid body, short, restricted neck, and an everted, simple rim with an indentation in the middle, perhaps to aid tying the mouth with a string or the imprint, imprint of a string tied around the lip to prevent the strongly everted rim from collapsing during the production, you can see here. There are no exact parallels to this shape in the central Anatolian late Bronze Age or in the Iron Age corpus of the region, at least that I'm aware of. Its capacity is 110 liters. It had two Anatolian hieroglyphic signs on its shoulder, the meaning of which is not clear. This is the only Anatolian hieroglyphic script that this is the Anatolian hieroglyphic script is the only script that continues into the post destruction period. But of course, during this period, Anatolian hieroglyphic is best known from monumental architectural contexts where kings and lords of the Neo-Hittite states recount their deeds to impress the visitors of their palaces and citadels. Anatolian hieroglyphic is accompanied by one, one or the other alphabetic scripts of this period, namely Phoenician or Aramaic. This is a new technology in writing and all the literate societies seem to want to show off that they also possess this new knowledge. For Cilicia and the Amuk, the chosen script is Phoenician. This is a result of complex web of connections tying Southern Levant with the Northern Levant and Cilicia where Cyprus acts as a pivotal intermediary and an anchor. Now to the famous Natalabic 3C pottery. In our excavations, a pit from uh, the south southernmost trench has yielded both central Anatolian type plain ceramics and late Helladic 3C period Aegean style ceramics. A marker of this period present in many uh, settlements in the Eastern Mediterranean. At Tarsus Gözükule, we have significant evidence for the co-occurrence of these two different traditions on site in the post-destruction period, a situation more clearly present in section B of Goldman excavations, uh, which I will be talking about shortly. The local plain and late Helladic 3C traditions represent two very different styles of tableware at Tarsus Gözükule. One involves mainly shallow bowls and plates to consume food from, and jars and pitchers to serve food with. The other mostly consists of bowls with handles, few craters, and few closed shapes, like jugs and stirrup jars. In other, in another, in other words, the Teladic 3C pottery is mostly represented by a very selected group of vessel shapes at Tarsus Gözükule, mainly dealing with display during food consumption. Clearly, the late Helladic 3C repertoire at Tarsus Gözükule would not have been sufficient to satisfy all the different functions of food production and consumption by the inhabitants of the settlement. The late Helladic 3C pottery from Goldman excavations is extensively studied by Penelope Mountjoy, who identify early to middle phases um, at Tarsus Gözükule. Mountjoy, in collaboration with Hans Mommsen, have conducted nutrient activation analysis on selected subgroup of late Helladic 3C shirts, and they demonstrated that most of the samples were of local production. The imported samples, on the other hand, demonstrate the complex networks operational during this period. 
at the center of which lies Cyprus, especially Kuklia. There are also connections to the East Aegean West Anatolian interface, albeit weaker than Cyprus, and Cyprus might be the intermediary for. The deposition of late Helladic 3C style pottery at Tarsus is best understood from section B of Goldman excavations, where we have a continuous stratigraphy from late bronze 2B into early Iron Age. Both the publication and the diaries make it clear that the area was leveled immediately after the destruction and rebuilt. A close reading of the excavation diaries show that there are two main building phases right after the destruction horizon. One is the earlier late bronze, late bronze 2B remains, and the later is the so-called phantom unit. Uh, christened as such because it was difficult to establish a meaningful plan from this badly disturbed intermediate level between late bronze and iron ages. The phantom unit was identified and coined by Dorothy Hannah Cox in her 1936 diary, provided a sketch of the plan of a building which never made it to the final publication. Her sketch shows that she could trace um, what she could trace of the so-called phantom unit building right below unit P. This building was made of stone foundations with a mud brick superstructure. The remarks of Cox in her diary stated clearly that the level belonging to the phantom unit has a high concentration of my LH3C pottery. Therefore, the phantom unit building must belong to the later late bronze 2B building period. Furthermore, the diaries give the impression that at least the lowest floors of unit P belong to the early Iron Age level. Because she reports much late bronze two type plain pottery and some painted pottery, including few Cypress Vision painted shirts. Therefore, it's very possible that unit P's earlier floors belong to the early Iron Age. And hence, here we have an area that was continuously used through the end of the late bronze into the early Iron Age. Along with the plainware and late Helladic 3C pottery, a local painted pottery type appears on the site sometime during late bronze 2B period and continues into the Iron Age. The hatch decorated pottery consists mainly of closed vessels and a much smaller number of open vessels. The vessel surfaces are decorated with broadly hatched zones in brown or red paint. Typically, the hatched zone is delimited by a broad band of paint at the carination. The distribution of Silesian painted pottery at Tarsus Gözükule ranges from late bronze 2B into early Iron Age levels. It coexists with late bronze 2 plainwares, late Helladic 3C pottery, and with the emerging Cypress Silesian painted pottery tradition. In the region, Silesian painted pottery is encountered at Kilisetepe in Göksu Valley, as well as at Solihöyük and Yumuktepe in Mersin. So far, Tarsus seems to be its westernmost occurrence. It's very probable that this is a West Silesian phenomenon. Considering that it occurs earlier at Kilisetepe and Solihöyük, and also it seems to be found in greater numbers at Kilisetepe, it's possible that rough, rough silicia is the origin of this class of local paint decorated pottery. As mentioned earlier, the importance of Göksu Valley as an important communication route is established by the red, red lustrous wheel made wear tradition that is distributed to many regions in Eastern Mediterranean and Central Anatolia. Clearly, that position continued into, the, into this tumultuous period, albeit in a much smaller scale. 
with all these different types of pottery styles coexisting in such a short time span, the eventual outcome is the so-called Cyprus Lycian pottery. Cypro Levantine, if you're looking uh, from a different perspective, of course. At Tarsus Gözlü Kule, it's an important part of the Iron Age pottery repertoire from the earliest levels on, where both local and imported kinds are found. What is remarkable about this pottery is that it develops in tandem with Cyprus, indicating the very close ties with this island during this period. During the early Iron Age levels at Tarsus Gözlü Kule, very little of this pottery is imported. Rather, they are mostly made of calcareous and heavy local clay. The development of both the shapes and the decorative vocabulary of this ware at Tarsus Gözlü Kule shows that the settlement of Gözlü Kule was in constant interaction with the inhabitants of the island, such that the idea of how to serve and consume food converged between these two regions. As part of an MA thesis, Zeyre Mutlu conducted petrographic analyses on a limited set of samples of Cyprus Lycian painted pottery from all Iron Age levels of Tarsus Gözlü Kule excavated by the Goldman team. Preliminary results confirm the macroscopic observations that predominantly one kind of fabric was used throughout the Iron Age by the potters of Gözlü Kule to manufacture this pottery. This main fabric is calcareous with dominant carbonates and quartz. It also contains feldspar, calcite, serpentinite, mica schist, and very few basalts. This mix of minerals in the clay confirms well with the alluvial nature of the local geology of the region, where the clay beds would be fed by the rivers draining the Taurus Mountains to the north, which would provide for the igneous elements in the mix. The Tarsian potters used this clay for a long period consistently through the Iron Age. It only gets better navigated in late Iron Age, also with better surface treatment, probably as a result of increasing competition with the Greek imports at the site during this period. Black on red also occurs from the earliest Iron Age levels at Tarsus Gözükule, both as local and as non-local specimens. There is also biochrome vessels produced using the same local fabric. Hence, at Tarsus Gözükule, all types of Cyprus Lycian painted pottery are attested. This is the case in all sites at Lycia. However, when one moves a bit further west, the situation changes. For example, at the neighboring region of Tautainat, the dominant class of pottery during Iron Age is red burnished wares, rather than the Cyprus Lycian painted wares. This is interesting considering that this pottery is also well developed in the Phoenician coast of the Levant and shows that the interaction networks in East Mediterranean were not uniform. Moreover, Taltainat produced large amounts of late Helladic 3C style pottery in the previous period, which shows shared interaction networks during the earlier late bronze 2B or Iron 1 period but these were not sustained in the Iron Age. It would be interesting to do a comparative analysis of this class of pottery from Cilicia, north and south coast of the Levant and Cyprus. Tarsus Gözü Kule shows a set of trajectories after the collapse of the centralized late Bronze Age powers that can be summed up as follows. The Mount of Gözükle is resettled immediately by the occupants into the debris of the late Bronze 2A destruction. And there seems to be several phases to the post-destruction occupation horizon. There is a strong continuation of the earlier late Bronze 2A ceramic tradition on the site. But also new customs are introduced, especially manifested by the late Heradic 3C type pottery. Importance of Cyprus in forging connections and mediating between these centers in southern and eastern coasts of the Mediterranean 
is clear from the imports during both late bronze 2B and Iron Age levels. The region reaches a level of connectivity during the Iron Age, which is reflected very well in the Koine of Cyprus Lycian or Cypro Levantine pottery. Ura, if indeed located at Silifke, would have been the point of contact between the south coast of Anatolia and Cyprus, as well as through the Göksu Valley would have connected central Anatolia to the Mediterranean, making it a natural gateway during the Late Bronze Age. Ura's importance is understood by King Nikmepa's complaints to the Hittite king, his overlord, about the growing economic powers of merchants coming from Ura in his city Ugarit. Another important gateway of its time. Did these connections forged earlier by the behest of the rulers of the superpowers transformed into more loosely, loosely administered and flexible web of networks after their grip has loosened, making room for new connections and eventually the interest to venture further west in search of new opportunity. At Tarsus Gözükule, the pithos with the Anatolian hieroglyphic inscription epitomizes the phenomenon of mixing the new and the traditional. The shape of the pithos is not typical, but the Anatolian hieroglyphic is a long-standing script in the region, which persists even be beyond the collapse of the Hittite empire. In monumental inscriptions, where Anatolian hieroglyphic is used extensively in the region, however, it's accompanied by the new alphabetic Phoenician script, a new technology in writing, easier to learn, and perhaps like iron, making the playing field more even for the affluent yet not the ruling class of the society. On Cyprus as well, the local syllabic script is used along with Phoenician through the Iron Age. This emphasis on continuing already known and established traditions, be it putting worms on stone and clay, making images on stone, or producing on cons or, and consuming food the traditional way, and coexistence of these long-standing traditions, along with very new innovative technologies like iron or a new script that are eagerly incorporated into the lives of the people are perhaps the main shared experiences of this period across the Northeast Mediterranean coastal settlements. Gunnar Lehmann, Lehmann, in his 2017 article summarizing the period succinctly for Kinet Höyük, concludes that the changes that are seen here are a result of non-centralized and multi-directional networks operating in Eastern Mediterranean during this period, a conclusion I share with them. As we can see from the later Greek and Phoenician trade networks, and established trade enclaves where different cultural aspects were accommodated, appropriated, reimagined, and reinterpreted, where Phoenician Melkart would be perceived as Greek Heracles in the mythology of Sicily, for example, where both Greek and Phoenician cultures were dynamically encountering the local traditions of the islanders, a new mental frame of reference is created that could be meaningful for all of these various peoples. It is very possible, that is what we, what we are seeing and hearing in the textual and iconographic information carved on the stone in the monumental architecture of the period in Cilicia, namely a constructed past and a reinterpreted present to accommodate all the different peoples who came into contact with each other within this very fluid world of the Iron Age. Hence, I find it not very fruitful to try to trace ethnicities and origins in the material culture of this period. It defies categorization because of this very complex web of entanglements which allow the people to create new identities almost constantly and reflect them in their material culture. 
The definition of being elite has shifted with new access to materials like silver that defined being elite in the previous period. And also introduction of novel technologies more accessible to the people locally like iron to level the playing ground for markers, for markers of elite them. How Greek is the late Helladic 3C pottery in late bronze 2B? It seems more and more clear that Mycenaean Greeks did not, did not have much to do with its production and distribution here in the Eastern Mediterranean. It was rather Cypriots who were pivotal in its widespread use, both in Cilicia and the Levant. There were all sorts of mobility in this part of the world, first instigated by the systemic collapse of the earlier late Bronze Age economic system. But later, as these groups established themselves in different parts of the Mediterranean, creating a hybrid mental frame, all of Eastern Mediterranean have become a beehive of movements where ideas, ideologies, tastes, desires, flowed through these information highways to create in the end mutually understandable modus operandi. That is of course, until the Neo-Assyrian empire could break its borders and decided to take advantage of this lucrative new economic system. But that is another story to tell. Thank you for attending the talk. And I appreciate it very much. And here is the list of our sponsors. Um, I am, of course, thankful to Asla Özyar, my colleague and dear friend, for making this all possible by overseeing our excavations at Tarsus Gözükule. I'm also thankful to all our wonderful team members, without whom no amount of financial support would make this excavation happen. I am also grateful for the wonderful ideas and inspirations of the colleagues that constantly feed my intellectual curiosity. Thank you very much. Um, you can go ahead and. Sorry. Now it should work. I'm sorry about that. Uh, one second. No worries. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Okay. Merhabalar. Ee, konuşmamın Türkçe özetini öncelikle bu konuşma serisini organize eden Artemis Yoryu ve Yanir Milevski'ye teşekkür ederek başlamak istiyorum. Konuşmada uzun süredir çalıştığım Tarsus Gözlü Kule yerleşmesi üzerine odaklandım. Ama bu Arva serisi Levant üzerine olduğu için o bölgeyle bağlantılar kurmaya özen gösterdim. Tarsus Gözlü Kule, Neolitik dönemden beri aralıksız yerleşilen bir yer olduğu için uzun süreli analizlerde bölgeyi anlamamızda önem arz eder. Bu konuşmada Geç Tunç Çağı ve Demir Çağı dönemlerine değinildi. Geç Tunç Çağı 2A dönemini en iyi Goldman kazıları A açmasından biliyoruz. Bu dönemde Hitit Krallığı'nın politik hegemonyası altında olan bölgenin maddi kültüründe de bunun etkili görmekteyiz. Burada Orta Anadolu'daki Hitit merkezlerinden gayet iyi bilinen seramiklerinden örnekler görmektesiniz. Bu döneme ait ve yapımı çok daha farklı olan kırmızı astarlı seramiklere Red Lustrous Wheel Made Wear olarak da biliniyorlar ise Tarsus'ta az da olsa rastlanmaktadır. Bunlar çok ince kirli ve yüzeyleri iyi perdahlanmış seramiklerdir. Fakat bunların çok miktarda rastlandığı kilise tepede üretildiği kozal ve meslektaşları tarafından tespit edilmiştir. Bu sayede Göksu Vadisi'nin bu dönemde Orta Anadolu'daki Hitit merkezlerinden Kıbrıs'a ve hatta Mısır ve Lavanta kadar geniş bir dağılıma sahip bu seramik grubuna ev sahibi olduğu anlaşılmıştır. Merkezi devletlerin yıkılmasıyla Hitit hegemonyası altındaki Çukurova'da da demografik, ekonomik ve politik değişiklikler gözlemlenir. 
Özellikle Goldman kazılarından bildiğimiz resmi Hitit binalarının yıkılması ile yerleşimde mimari daha ziyade mesken olarak kullanılan binalara dönüşür. Profesör Aslı Özyer Başkanlığı'nda 2001 yılından beri süre gelen Boğaziçi Üniversitesi kazılarında da bu döneme ait katmanlara rastlanmıştır. En güneydeki açmada bulunan çöp çukurları bu döneme tarihlenmektedir ve buradan elde, ele geçen seramikler bir önceki dönemden iyi bildiğimiz Orta Anadolu tarzı seramiklerin devamıdır. En çok rastlanan form olan sığ, çanak ve tabaklar kabaca yapılmış ve yüzeyleri itinasız bir şekilde düzeltilmiştir. Ekseriyetle hala yarı sertken şekillendirilen tabanlarında kullanılan aletlerin izlerini görmek mümkündür. Pişirme kapları için ise bölgeye has bir kil kullanılmaktadır. Bol miktarda kalkı katkılı bu kil seramiklerin sürekli maruz kaldığı ısınma ve soğumalardan dolayı meydana gelebilecek ısı şoklarını azaltmak üzere özel olarak yapılmış olmalıdır. Pişirme kapları bu tarz kil kullanılarak geç tunç bir döneminden beri değişmeden üretilmektedir. Formları da yerel formlardır. Ayrıca yerinde bulunan bu saklama kapı da bilinen formlara ait değildir. Omuzunda iki adet Anadolu hieroglifi kazınmış olan bu saklama kabı yeni formuyla Anadolu'da çok uzun süredir kullanılan bu yazı biçimini bir araya getirerek dönemin yaratıcı ve yeni mentalitesini öne çıkarır. Tarsus Gözlü Kule'de bu dönemde Orta Anadolu tarzı seramiklerle beraber bölgede hızlı bir dağılım gösteren Geç Helas 3C tarzı seramiklere beraber rastlanmaktadır. Penelope Mountjoy ve meslektaşları tarafından yapılan inceleme ve analizlerde bu seramiklerin çoğunun yerel üretim olduğu, ithal edilenlerin çoğunun da Kıbrıs'tan geldiği anlaşılmıştır. Bu seramiklerin yerleşimde zaman içinde nasıl geliştiği en iyi Goldman kazılarının B açmasında anlaşılmaktadır. Buna göre Hitit dönemi yerleşim Hitit döneminde yerleşim yıkıldıktan sonra hemen tekrar tekrar inşa edilir ve bu en alt katmanlarda hala Orta Anadolu tarzı seramikler yoğundur. Mavi ile gösterilen seviyede geç Helas 3C seramikleri artış gösterir ve sarı olarak gösterilen katmanlarda en üst seviyeye ulaşır. Yerleşimde bunlarla beraber yerel bir boyalı seramik grubuna da rastlanır. Bu seramiklere en çok kilise tepede rastlanmaktadır. Orada ve Mersin, Solih Höyük'te daha erken dönemlerde rastlanılan bu seramiklerin üretim merkezleri Göksu Vadisi olmalıdır. Bir arada rastlanılan bütün bu değişik seramik gruplarının sonucunda demir çağının başlangıcında Kıbrıs Çukurova boyalıları, Cyprus Vision olarak da bilinir, yeni bir boyalı seramik grubu ortaya çıkar. Ağırlıklı geometrik bezemeleri olan bu seramikler Tarsus Gözlü Kule'de demir çağının en erken seviyelerinden beri bulunur. Zehri Mutlu'nun lisan süslü test çalışmasının bir parçası olarak Tarsus Gözlü Kule'de Goldman kazılarında ortaya çıkarılmış bu boyalı seramiklerin bir kısmına petrografik analiz yapılmıştır. Buna göre bu seramiklerin çoğu kalkerli bir yapısı olan yerel kilden üretilmişlerdir. Bu seramikler bütün Doğu Akdeniz bölgesinde geniş bir yayılım gösterirler. Özellikle Kıbrıs'ta da görülen bu seramiklerin hem gelişmesinde hem de geniş dağılımında tahminen Kıbrıs önemli bir rol oynamıştır. Demir çağında merkezi devletlerin yıkılmasıyla onların kontrolü altında olan deniz ticaret yolları, yolları Doğu Akdeniz kıyılarında önemli liman merkezlerinin ve burada yaşayan insanların iştirakine açılarak daha esnek ve canlı ticaret ağlarının kurulmasına sebep olmuştur. Hem Çukurova hem Levant kıyılarında sıkça rastlanan bu boyalı seramiklerin bu kadar benzer bir biçimde gelişmiş olmalarında kuşkusuz Kıbrıs'ın rolü büyüktür. Beni dinlediğiniz için teşekkür ederim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.